Alhamdulillah <tuh> الدكتور زين المستقيم الحاج الماجستير كرئيس الجامعة الإسلامية الحكومية بكلام المكرم صاحب الفضيلة كنائب الأول الثاني الثالث برئيس الجامعة الإسلامية الحكومية بكلام المكرم سعادة الأستاذ الدكتور أجيدي روحيانا الحاج الماجستير كالمدير للدراسة العليا بالجامعة الإسلامية الحكومية بكالونان المكرم سعادة الدكتورة سسميلينسي الماجستير كنائب لقسم التعليم العليا بالجامعة الإسلامية الحكومية بكالونان المكرم سعادة الأساتذة والأساتذة وجميع الأصحاب الأحبة رحمكم الله جميع الأساتذة المحترم وأصدقاء المحبوب أولا هي بنا نشكر الله عز وجل الذي قد أعطانا نعما كثيرة وبخصوص نعمة الإيمان والإسلام حتى أن نتسمع في هذا الوقت السعيد والمكان المبارك في البرنامج الندوة العالمية الافتراضية الرابعة للدراسة العليا بالجامعة الإسلامية بكالونان إن شاء الله ثانيا صلاة وسلاما دائمين متلازمين على حبيبنا وشفيعنا وكرة أعيننا سيدنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نرجو إلى شفاعته من يوم هذا إلى يوم الآخر آمين آمين يا رب العالمين Ladies and gentlemen We are very delighted to meet all of you on the second day of the fourth international virtual conference on Islamic studies, IT 2021, organized by the postgraduate program, State Islamic Institute of Pekalongan, Indonesia. This conference highlights the theme religion and global innovation, the thinking of spiritual contribution to develop harmony and living resilience. Respectful ladies and gentlemen, on the second day of IT 2021, we have three invited speakers. First, Professor Dustin Cowell from University of Wisconsin Medicine, USA. Second, Professor Nadir Shah Hussein from Monash University, Australia. And the last one, Professor Peter C. Taylor from Murdoch University, Australia. Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we'd like to invite the moderator, Mrs. Titin Swastiningsi, PhD, 
to, to lead to this conversation. Mrs. Titin, we give the stage to you. Thank you. Check, 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 International Virtual Conference on Islamic Studies, ICIS 2021. This conference is organized by the Postgraduate Program of IEN Institute of Islamic Studies, Pekalongan, Indonesia. Today, Sunday, 28 November 2021, is the second day session, and I'm Titian Swastiningsi Subari, is responsible for moderating the session. Ladies and gentlemen, religion and globalization have always shared a relationship of struggle and conflict. Globalization is generally associated with economic and political interdependence, which has brought people closer. By removing barriers between different cultures, globalization can actually place religion in a strategic position that strengthens social identity to accept a new reality that religion is not a problem for global innovation. Religion has stood in the face of complexities and onslaught of the modern world and seems to have intensified under the conditions of contemporary development. Therefore, Rethinking how spirituality can contribute to the development of harmony and living resilience is the utmost relevant topic for the fourth ICIS. Therefore, the topic of today's session is Religion and Global Innovation, Rethinking of Spiritual Contributions to Develop Harmony and Living Resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, On today's session, we have very important persons with us. Honorable Associate Professor Zainal Mutakin, the Rector of IIN Pekalongan. Professor Ade Dedi Rohayana, the Director of Postgraduate Program. And Associate Professor Suspinisi, the Vice Director of Postgraduate Program of IIN Pekalongan. And also, we have three keynote speakers who will share their expertise with us. They are Professor Dustin Carroll Cowell from University of Wisconsin, Madison, United States of America. Professor Nadirza Hussain of Monash University, Australia. And Professor Peter Sinclair Taylor of Monash Bulldog University, Western Australia. 
Well, uh, before we begin our session, let me inform you that this keynote session will be divided into three sessions. The first session will be from 8 to 9.30 Indonesian time for Professor Dustin Cowell, then followed by question and answer session. And then from 9.30 to 11 a.m., is for Nadir Sahasen to have his presentation and followed by Q&A. And then we have lunch break from 11 to 12 a.m. And then the third session then will be from 12 to 1 p.m. for Professor Peter Taylor's presentation, then followed by Q and answer from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, we would like, like to inform you that uh, there is a change of uh, schedule today because of uh, the wide range of topics that the presenters will present today. And then uh, for the rules, as usual, we have to inform you that participants are automatically muted at the beginning of a session. And please keep yourself muted unless you are invited to speak by the moderator. And all, and all participants may address questions, questions at each presentation. Questions, questions for individual presentation can be placed in the chat box provided from the beginning until the end of presentation. And then the moderator will pick up your questions. Or else you can use raise hand feature to address your questions directly to the speaker. Well, not just wasting time, time, let's begin the first keynote session. Professor, Professor Dustin Carroll Cowell. But before he presents, I would like to read his bio for sure. Professor, professor Dustin Cowell is a professor emeritus of Arabic language and literature department of African Cultural Studies, University of Wisconsin Medicine, USA. Professor Dustin did his PhD in comparative literature with a specialization in medieval Arabic and Spanish literature in March 1976. The poetry of Ibn Ab Abdi Rabihi was the poet laureate to Abdul Ar-Rahman III, the first caliph of Cordova. This dissertation involved the compilation of the poet's works from the diverse sources, all in classical Arabic. The editing this collection, the translation of the corpus into English, and an introductory literary study dealing with questions of literary history, thematics, poetic structure, and metrics. His Bachelor of Arts in Spanish Language and Literature is from Pomona College, Claremont, California, June 1967. Positions held teaching Arabic at University of Wisconsin Medicine, instructor from 1973 till 1970. Six, assistant professor from 1976 to 1980, associate professor 1980 to 1999, professor 1999 to 2016, emeritus professor 2007 till until present. Professor Dustin is very familiar with the Arabic literature in USA, Arabic and Asian countries too. He has been teaching and delivering lectures across Indonesia. And he served as the executive director of the Center for Arabic Study Abroad at the American University in Cairo from June 1980 to May 1982. And now, and Professor Dustin, today's presentation is entitled Mysticism, a Path to Tolerance and Social Harmony. Please welcome to the screen, Professor Dustin Cohen. Time is yours. Hello, Professor Dustin. How are you? I'm so, I'm so sorry, sorry, I can't, I can't hear, hear your voice. voice. Okay. okay, maybe you, you can still mute your microphone. 
You don't, don't hear my voice. Okay. <laughs> can, can I hear my voice? Okay. 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 How are you? Fine. Thank you so much. Okay. Check your sound words before we start. Can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. Okay, I hear you now, thank you. Thank you. My screen, my screen being screen is shared properly. Can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Hello, good, good morning. morning. This is a great pleasure for me to speak to you in this uh, forum. And. Into a, into a point of departure. I wonder, are you hearing me okay? Can you hear me okay? Like speak to my uh, point, into, into, into point of departure. I am not a specialist in religion and spiritual issues, merely a lay observer. I speak from the perspective of a world citizen seeking peace and harmony throughout the world. I recognize the contributions of different spiritual traditions which appear to promote social harmony, tolerance, and mutual respect for persons.
It is a quotation from an old Japanese poem written in the 14th century. This model expresses the idea that although Indonesia is of a tremendous diversity of cultures, languages, ethnicities, religions, and beliefs, it is nevertheless a unified nation. We are now in a world of crisis. Authoritarian governments or those in position of power are controlling and persecuting others. As an American citizen, I have a responsibility to look at the shortcomings of my own society. First, we think of human rights, but at the same time, transgress the rights of others. My nation, namely the United States of America, declares war, bringing about millions of deaths in the name of revenge and or other questionable pretexts. We maintain an inhumane prison system in Guantanamo Bay and the island of Cuba in violation of the very human rights we pretend to defend. Despite the many strides in social reform over the years, my nation is suffering from the gross misuse of power by agents of government authority as exemplified by the deaths of many citizens of racial minorities at the hands of police forces using inadmissible forms of repression and violence. My nation regrettably supports foreign governments that persecute their own population. My nation, unfortunately, is not a leader in the world with regard to environmental awareness, such as the world food supply is endangered. The water we drink is tainted and low-lying areas are under threat by raising sea levels. And that is a special concern, I think, for the city of Takalongan, which lies so close to the sea and is uh, at a low level. The burden of uh, COVID-19 has made the poor poor throughout the world, uh, not only in income, but in health care as well. We see that within the United States itself, in Europe and throughout other parts of the world. What can we learn from spiritual masters? Through spirituality, greed and the thirst for power and control become exposed. Through meditative practices that strive towards a pure heart, those negative forces that promote the desire to subjugate others are filtered out in a natural way. Our education institutions must strive to encourage the virtues of kindness and compassion. At the root of social conflict is the fear, distrust, or even hate of the other, that other of a different race, social class, religion, cultural upbringing, a way of life. Let's talk about now Islamic perspective in the realm of spirituality. The Quranic teachings of tolerance, respect for others, defense of the weak and unfortunate, and the desire for peace and harmony among mankind are central to Islamic belief. The body of knowledge based upon the Sunnah and the study of Hadith provides guidance for all humankind. The message of love, compassion, and forgiveness is central to Islamic thought. Mysticism embraces a spiritual practice that in its pure form represents an individual's effort to reach a higher spiritual level. Mystical practice may take various forms depending upon the religious or cultural tradition from which it stems. I'd like in this uh, talk to just uh, highlight two towering spiritual masters in the Islamic tradition and then mention how mysticism is a prominent theme in modern Arabic literature, as exemplified by a novella by the Sudanese, late Sudanese author, Tayyip Salah. 
So first I'll be addressing Abu Hamid Al-Ghazali um, of Iran, Muhyiddin um, Ibn Arabi as Sheikh Al-Akbar, uh, who lived from 1855 to 1240, and then Al-Tayb Saleh, who was born in 1929 and lived until 2009. So let's begin with Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, born in 1058, and lived until 1111 of the Common Era. Al-Ghazali has many uh, famous writings. Uh, among of them is a book called Al-Maqsad Al-Asna, Fi Sharh Asma Allah Al-Husna. It's been translated by David Burnell and Nasir Zahir as the 99 beautiful names of God. And uh, within this book, he, this, the Al-Ghazali mentions the attributes of God or names of God. Um, and I have chosen to focus in on his commentary on the word al-wadud, or attribute al-wadud. And he writes in his book, uh, al-wadud, huwa alladhi yuhibbu al-khair li jamil khalq, fa yasnu ilayhim, wa yasni alayhim, wa huwa qareeb min ma'ana al-rahim. Uh, the authors of this, uh, the translators have translated this as uh, El Wadud, or the loving kind, is one who weighs, who wishes all creatures well and accordingly favors them and praises them. And of course, they, uh, Rizali also mentions that it's closely meaning to the word Rahim, as we know, the all merciful, the all beneficent. So Rahma and Wadud then are, are close synonyms. And we can turn to the this use of this word in the Quran al-Karim, Bismillah, innahu huwa yubdi'u wa yu'idu wa huwa al-aghafur al-wadud. It is he who creates everything from the beginning and causes it to return, and he is all forgiving, al-aghafur, all loving, al-wadud. And al-Ghazali has written in his works, Awadud min ibadallah man yuridu lil khalq Allah kullu ma yuriduhu li nafsihi wa ala man dhalika man yu'thiruhu yu'thiruhum ala nafsihi So the all loving among God's servants is one who desires for God's creatures whatever he desires for himself not only that but one whoever prefers them to himself so preferring others and preferring the benefit or the um, giving and always uh, preferring uh, what is good for others. This is what was oftentimes in, in the English language referred to as the golden rule. Al-Ghazali goes on to say, Kaman kale minhum uridu an akuna jisran ala nar, yabur al khalq. Is like one who said, I would like to be a bridge over fire so the creatures may pass over me and not be harmed by it. So the ultimate uh, giving of oneself for the benefit of others. Thinking about others' happiness, completely anti-egocentric, altruistic. This then uh, is the essence of Ed Wadud, uh, the the believer who thinks of others and not himself, puts others in, in, in before his own desires. And in a, a letter uh, to a disciple entitled Ayyuh al Walad, uh, Al Zali has written, Kulama Amutabinas, Ibalhu Kama Sardali Nafsika Minhum. So whenever you interact with people, deal with them as you would wish yourself to be dealt with by them. For a worshiper's faith is incomplete until he wants for other people what he wants for himself. And also Ghazali has written, 
Then I call her Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He to kesarat bi ayatuhu wa adma wajuhu wa dar darba ala humma ifsurin kauman fa innahum la ya'lamun. This is what he's referring to a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless you be upon him, uh, saying that when uh, when his tooth was broken and his face was struck and bloody by, was by a opponent, uh, he said, Lord, guide my people who they do not know. In other words, it's a complete uh, expression of forgiveness and love for even the enemy. And so, and uh, in reference to this hadith, Al Ghazali comments that not even the actions of those who wish him harm prevented him uh, from wishing good for them. This idea of even wishing uh, good for one's enemies. Or one's opponent. And then, of course, and then, of course, on the um, um, on a, tra a tradition of the uh, described to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, um, it is said, Walevi, Nefsi, Biedihi, Layamun Abdun, Hapti, Hibli Jarihi. So he says, and by the one in whose hand I wish to be, what amongst you believes truly, um, or, uh, until one likes for his brother or for his neighbor that which he loves for himself? Again, another expression of the um, what we think of as the golden rule. Now we turn to another uh, towering figure in the history of Islamic philosophy and thought and mysticism, namely Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, referred to uh, in the Sufi circles as a Sheikh al-Akbar. Ibn Arabi was born in the Andalusian Taifa or tiny kingdom of Murcia on the eastern coast of the Iberian Peninsula in 1165 of the Common Era. He made the pilgrimage in, to Mecca in 1201, never to return to Al-Andalus and continued his life there, teaching and traveling in Iraq and Anatolia until he finally settled down in Damascus in the year 1222, where he established himself as a scholar, trained disciples, and wrote prolifically. The works that attributed him are so numerous and they haven't all been properly studied. Um, then he passed away in Damascus in 1240. And here we see where he was born and raised and got his early education in the little tiny kingdom of Murcia, which lies on the southeastern coast of the Iberian Peninsula. We see on the right uh, um, at a certain period in the history of Al-Andalus, um, the green representing uh, areas under Islamic control and the gray areas under the, uh, the Christian, so-called Christian kingdoms. Of course, this, this map uh, would uh, change from year to year uh, with different political uh, events. Within Sufi circles, Ibn Arabi um, is considered, often considered the greatest of all Muslim philosophers. His philosophy is not rationalistic, but can be characterized as maybe perhaps illuminative. Um, his prolific works include Quranic commentary, Hadith scholarship, principles of jurisprudence, and principally mysticism. Um, within the Sufi circles, he's admired for his attention to detail and, and the profundity of his argumentation. However, his works are generally deemed extremely difficult to understand. Written in a highly symbolic language, abundant in allegories, 
which makes the, the translations work extremely difficult uh, in his use of symbolic language. And in fact, he's try in trying to uh, describe the mystical, even finds language itself a hindrance. Ibn Arabi's fame within the Islamic world spread within a century of his death. Uh, even, uh, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, they reached uh, China and were appreciated by the authors of the Han Kitab Chinese Muslim School and were, were fundamental in shaping some of their worldviews and bringing together Confucianism and Islam. Uh, he began. He then became known in the West with publication, uh, publications by Henry Corbin in 1958 and Toshiko Isutsu in 1966, when his contributions to world philosophy came to be recognized. So it's relatively recent that his uh, his, his contributions have been recognized uh, in the West. Uh, his most massive work, entitled Al Futuhat al Nakiya, has been estimated to fulfill to fill some one fifteen thousand pages uh, in a modern edition. Uh, he has much poetry, which is deemed which is very symbolic, um, mystical in nature. This is one example. This is an excerpt. I marveled at an ocean without shore, at a shore that did not have an ocean, and at a morning light without darkness, and at a night that was without daybreak, and then a sphere with no locality. This kind of close to this idea of eradication of binary opposition. Of course, we know in language, language is built upon binary opposition. Uh, so black, uh, black does not have meaning without white, and uh, we, we, we have opposing meaning. Uh, in his philosophy, um, as explained by Professor Michael Sells, in Chicago, in his uh, brilliant studies of Ibn Arabi, um, at one point, um, when the disciple or the when the um, mystic in his meditation tries to come and do direct conversation with the Almighty, there is a kind of a blurring and distinctions blur out and there's a kind of oneness and the the spirit of the of the believer tries to become in, in a kind of union with the Almighty. And so that the, the differences um, between saints are eradicated. It's just like an ocean without shore, a shore having no ocean, light um, without darkness, uh, night without daybreak. So a sphere that has no uh, place. So this is kind of you, you pass into a different state of existence uh, out of the real physical world. It surpasses language. The so language is actually impossible to relate the reality of the mystical experience and the union with, with the Almighty. Another poem. My heart can take on any form. A meadow for gazelles, a cloister for monks, for the idols sacred ground, Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, the tables of the Torah, the souls of the Quran. I profess the religion of love. Wherever its caravan turns along the way, that is the belief, the faith I keep. So we see that in his vision becomes quite ecumenical, that he sees himself as others on their own spiritual journeys from different traditions. He can appreciate the, the Christian mystic, the Jewish mystic, um, and 
you see the, the oneness of humankind. No longer it's a kind of, I am a certain belief and you're a different belief, but we all together are human in our diversity and then in our desire to become God's servant and to become united with, with God. And what unites us all is love. Of course, that same uh, concept uh, we find in Al-Ghazali's writing of the all-loving Al-Wudud, that attribute of God. Now I'll mention another, mysticism is a very important theme in modern Arabic literature. Uh, for example, it, it plays a, a role in the works of the Egyptian author, a Nobel laureate, Nabib Mahfouz. Uh, but I would like to refer to, uh, in this, uh, this time, a little novella um, written by the Sudanese author, Tayyip Saleh, um, from Northern Sudan, in which this novella recounts a little village, a little village in the Sudan. Uh, there are three main, uh, the several main characters, among them the young man Zayn, who was an awkward person, uh, um, almost considered to be like a fool, but he is, he is the friend of a holy man called Hanin. And in this story also is the Imam, but he is um, focused more on fiqh and dogma and hellfire and brimstone in this sermon. And he seems to uh, be lacking in the true essence of love of the Islamic message. And so in this story, Hanin um, and Zayn, this village idiot, interact. And the story begins with the, the wedding of Zayn, who at the end, uh, at this point in his life, marries the most beautiful, pious lady of the village, despite him being a fool. And this we see the kind of, um, where mysticism brings the whole village together in a kind of social harmony. It's a very um, beautiful story. And I recommend it all to you all. It's been translated into English, of course, and other languages. And so through mysticism, uh, one can reach a higher life, life and it can bring about social harmony. I'd like to mention other uh, spiritual um, activities. Um, we have in the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, the Center for Healthy Mind, uh, which strives for a vision of a kinder, wiser, more compassionate world. It was founded by Professor Sir Richard Rich Davidson, who became inspired after meeting with the Dalai Lama in India in 1992. The Dalai Lama challenged him and said, Professor Richardson, uh, you in um, study of the mind, give so much attention to negative qualities like depression and anxiety. Why can't you think more about kindness and compassion and focus your research on these aspects of human nature? So in, 19, in 2011, the center uh, inaugurated what we call the kindness curriculum. And at the basis of this uh, center is the idea of mindfulness. Of course, this is a term used by many, uh, now not just at the center. Um, and there's an organization called mindfulness.org. And then in that, uh, Web page, they describe uh, mindfulness being um, as a basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we are doing, and not overly react reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. So we kind of retreat from the everyday life. And this practice then encourages meditation. Meditation focusing on attention to the well-being of others, just as we saw in um, 
San Gonzales. This practice encourages a break in the daily routine when we suspend judgment and cultivate both warmness and kind. We don't try to look for the defects of others. We don't think of, we don't cultivate hate and aggression, but whether we, our thoughts are permeated by warmth and kindness. And uh, this practice has the potential to become a transformational social phenomenon. Imagine if everybody in our schools, primary schools, were able to uh, practice kind of meditation and think about the wellness of others and kindness so they could overcome the aggression and violence that are supporting our society. Here I have a picture of um, recording in progress. A uh, picture of of uh, mindfulness uh, mindfulness uh, trainers of the University of Wisconsin. So mindfulness cultivates positive thinking. It is a door for innovation and creative solutions to the challenges of our ever changing world. It can be practiced through meditation, focusing on breath, as we do in the yoga tradition. And is it compatible with our religious beliefs? It doesn't require you to believe in any particular belief system. Become aware. And uh, the Muslim, of course, may um, use that and then, uh, for example, be involved in a kind of Islamic uh, meditation. In fact, it just, just combine them in a sense. Uh, this, maybe it's just a form of, you might think it's a form of Islamic meditation too for the Muslim. And for others, it's a, whether it's a Christian or Hindu or Buddhist, it's a matter of being at one with the universe, the spirituality, uh, and removing oneself from the negative uh, emotions that entrap us in our daily lives. I might add that one can be a, a mystic uh, in a certain portion of, of one's life. Um, doesn't mean that one it stops being an active member of society. And one can drop out of the world in a meditative stance, but then one can return to the world and be an activist for social justice and fight for the rights of others. And take an active part in making this a better world for all. And uh, I'd like to bring it to uh, mention another uh, book, which I have found very inspirational in my own spiritual journey um, by Sakyong Lipan. It's a, he's a Buddhist practitioner, practitioner and also from Tibet. Of course, he is belief system is based on Buddhism, but he is a writing uh, can be applied to all who seek a spiritual journey. Um, and his idea of moving one's world, of directing your thoughts to the benefit of others, very much in line with our Uthin and Ghazali. So in the essence, it's kind of like a Ghazali in a Buddhist form. Um, so it's seeing the world through the lenses of compassion and love. And he tries to develop a vision of the world, illuminated by passion, love, and enhanced meditation and positive thinking. And the book is beautiful, has about 24 chapters and each chapter is short and can be Recording used, stopped. Can be used uh, for um, uh, meditation. So one's a reflection of the day. Now I'd like to speak of contemporary challenges in society. We see the rise of groups seeking power and control throughout the world. We note the role of mass media in forming public opinion and framing the Recording discourse. in progress. There is a perpetuation of unjust social structures permeating all aspects of social life. There's an ongoing tragic deterioration of the environment by reason of human activity.
And this has been, uh, the uh, environment has been addressed by Islamic scholars and activists. There's a model uh, proposed by Professor Ode El Belushi at the Arabian Gulf University in Bahrain to address climate change and ensure sustainability. He has what we call, he calls green activism or a variety of jihad, green innovation, it's jihad, and green lifestyles, the zohar. So it's a model embodying a concept here called degrowth, with attention to harmony between humanity and nature, quite in line with Sufi concepts as well. And here in, this, uh, in, in Indonesia, there are also many activists we call for a green Islam. Um, in 2006, Iskandar Owonusu founded a permaculture farm in Imogiri, near Yogyakarta, named Bumi Langit, Italy, land and sky in which food is raised in accordance with the best ecological practices. Think of organic farming where we do not use pesticides which bring poison to our bodies and to the earth and to the water system. This farm works in tandem with activists and universities to support sustainable agriculture. Central to this project is a kind of eco mysticism. And the idea that humans are the creator's servants who serve as custodians of Khalifa, of Khulafa, of the earth, and who must refrain from harming the earth. And we then, as good as the earth from God, then must not harm the earth. And here is a beautiful picture of Bumi Langit in Imogiri. See how beautifully uh, the different plants are laid out and cared for. Kind of almost like a, um, might imagine a paradise almost like that. And educational institutions throughout the world can play a great role in bringing about harmony and peace. But the University of Wisconsin, as I uh, mentioned, is in a country which fosters violence, uh, great social injustice, discrimination. But universities can be a beacon and lead, lead the way to get society, to move society towards a better world. Now, of course, the United States is divided between two opposing camps, those of a, who support Donald Trump and his agenda, and those who work for a more equitable world. Um, and we saw even the violence that was perpetrated on the 6th of, of, of January in a grab for power, overturning the democratic process. But before this all happened, even still during the uh, Trump era, um, and it's been quite a, uh, a long time that the academic community has been well aware of social injustices. We note that the number of students of black heritage is far below their number of the population, we note how the jails are full of, of black citizens. And we note that the, the education system has, has failed them. There are not enough resources given to schools of the, the, the younger years to help youngsters not join gangs and deal in drugs. Well, now there is an ongoing effort at the University of Wisconsin uh, to promote, carry out, to promote diversity, combat hate, and promote mutual respect and harmony for members of the campus community and beyond. It's conducted by the Office of Student Affairs and many other offices within the university. 
Here we see uh, the web page of the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, the, the, the the pictures we see on this uh, web page uh, uh, rotate uh, every two hours, every hour. Uh, but um, this particular picture um, often appears and put out a statement, but we see uh, in the forefront a Muslim woman wearing hijab. This is kind of a, a message saying, yes, our university is diverse. We respect women of the Islamic faith and their right to dress in accordance with Islamic customs. And we must, and they are part of our community and we respect them. And so when diversity um, is oneness, it says in the Beneka uh, Tungo Ika. So the Office of um, Student Affairs uh, sponsors frequent talks and workshops. For example, just uh, two years ago, um, Professor Jane's inclusivity um, and having different workshops about power and cultural humility, micro messaging, how uh, one would maybe the glance or greeting people in the street, how these micro messages, how, what kind of signals they, they send. And then environmental injustice. We've had a terrible uh, example of that in the state of Michigan, in the city of Flint, mostly populated by poor black people. The government of that state of Michigan made no effort to, to ensure that the water supply was pure. It was contained, the water supply was contaminated by industrial pollutants. And the, there was no effort to, to monitor this in, in fact, the signature to the rich communities, uh, which had sourced to good water. Of course, the residents were not told about the, the poisons in the water supply. This is a, a example of how political power and greed uh, act in, uh, in opposition to the rights of the underprivileged. And so um, I happened to be in with, um, at the university in 2019 and at the, uh, one of the libraries, so lots of posters put up by the uh, Office of Students. And so we have on the left here, a uh, young woman saying, I am a union director environmentalist, terrorist dweller, man of the neighbor. So we see a young Muslim woman, a US citizen, a member of the Kanapa community and active, active in the uh, student government. We have another woman here, a uh, bilingual communicator, healthcare researcher, diversity devotee. She was working for diversity. And we have represented from the black community showing a black man uh, being a computer scientist, selling in his studies. And liking uh, riding his bicycle around the campus. Another woman um, uh, in geography uh, considers herself a world student. So we have we have the idea of the of the world citizen. We are not just loyal to our nation state, but we go beyond. We study foreign languages. We study different cultures. We see things with different perspectives. This is all the essence of what the benefits of cross-cultural understanding of studying in different cultures and learning different languages. Here we also see a, a woman probably of uh, Indian origin, um, a, problem, a man of uh, Chinese background, but who is a native of Chicago, you know, science, about to climb rocks. It's trying to show that we are all students. We are all together in this community of Wisconsin. We come with different backgrounds, but we are one. We are brought together in our, our love of humanity and uh, appreciation of this, our oneness and diversity. 
we have, a, you'll see uh, many signs throughout the United States in progressive communities, you might say. Um, this is uh, showing uh, the coexist. So we see the, in the left, the Islamic symbol. And we see the Judaic symbol in the center. We see the Christian symbol at the end. And we see symbols from um, yin and yang of the Asian tradition. We see, for example, the E MC square, the data of science. We see um, peace. And another example of a workshop that uh, many workshops that we see on the campus, responding to hate, public talk and student workshop. We, so of course, we have some of the instances of, of hate on campus. And that means we have to make a great effort to contradict that, or to counterpose that. So in my gluten thought, let us all pray for a kinder, gentler, gentler society, the world over, in which the rights of all are honored and revered, which all are free to develop their potential to the fullest in a positive and cheerful world. Thank you for attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we invite uh, the participants to address the question. You can use raise hand feature to address your question directly to the speaker, or you can write on the chat box provided. And we kindly ask participants to introduce themselves and to keep their question short and concise, of course. Okay. Uh, any questions, questions from, from the participants? participants? Or oh, raise, raise hands. Hand. From, from um, Mr. Mr. Imam. Oh, oh Mr. Mr. Imam Hanafi. Okay. okay. Directly, Directly to address the question to the speaker. speaker. Please. Please. Yes, yes, Mr. Mr. Imam Hanafi. Please address your question. You, Mr. Titrin as moderator. Hello, Mr. Dustin. Hello. Can you hear me, Mr. Dustin? Hello. Hello, Hello, Professor Dustin, are you there? Okay, this is the problem. Hello. How about Hello, now? Prof. Dustin, please, please unmute, unmute your, microphone. your microphone. I think yes, um, yeah. Okay, Mr. Dustin, can you hear me? I hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you, Mr. Dassin. Uh, I think this is a very, very amazing presentation from you. <laughs> Inspiring and full of academic uh, information that uh, stimulates us to further discussion. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Dassin. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to do this myself. My name is Iman from Pekalongan City. <laughs> Glad you make your acquaintance. Okay. Uh, my, my first question to you, Mr. Dustin, 
uh, what exactly means by spiritual. Uh, some people say uh, that spiritual is awareness of the outside and zoom in, uh, uh, and beyond of zoom in dimension. Uh, from these understandings, uh, the practice of mysticism emerges from the power of Satan uh, that we call as a black mysticism. And some people took from religious teaching uh, can be called as white mysticism. According to you, Mr. Dustin, uh, which one the truly spiritual? Yeah, which one the truly spiritual? The first question. And the second, uh, uh, in some uh, modern and scholar countries, uh, the phenomenon of spiritual awareness is increasing, but it's not based on formal religions. So we find a motto as they said, spirituality yes, organized religions no. Yeah. According to you, Mr. Uh, Dustin, uh, uh, can you explain the phenomenon uh, in this uh, in, in your country? Uh, among the former religions in this world, which religion has complex and comprehensive spiritual teachings? Uh, maybe you see that Islam has green spirituality. It is it is because uh, in Islam, it truly have a, a specific method to develop spirituality, uh, we call as Toriko. In this organized organization of uh, Toriko, we find uh, some uh, practice, uh, practical guides uh, to, uh, to find the God. Yeah. So, uh, the ones more uh, I want to ask you, Mr. Dustin, uh, uh, which front uh, the spirituality uh, exactly do you mean? Do me, you mean? Yeah. Well, it I is because, you, yeah. Well, I think that uh, I refer to the kind of spirituality you have mentioned in Islam and of the uh, Tariqa or Tara'iq. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, which is um, uh, very uh, prominent, in, for example, in studies like Egypt, um, and uh, that uh, promote a kind of meditation and spirituality, uh, such as we find uh, by the Sufi masters of, of um, Ghazali and, uh, and, and, um, and Muhyiddin al Arabi, Ibn al Arabi. So, yes, uh, of course, there are. You can find things like negative spirituality, like in black magic, perhaps, um, uh, with the which uh, converting with the devil, those kind of things. It's a kind of a negative, of course. Uh, and I don't um, not talking about that as at all. I'm talking about the positive in which uh, people try to become close to um, a higher spirit, uh, spiritual being, perhaps. Um, and be in tune and harmony with other human beings on this world. Uh, whatever, whatever uh, thought or whatever it is teaching they may, they may come from. And of course, the, um, the Sambha tradition and the Sufi tradition is an ideal example of this. I wonder if that has answered your question. Yeah, Pak Imam. So, so Prof. Dustin, Dustin has uh, answered answer his question, question, but this is, I think this is for the first question. question. If, uh, he still he has another question, question. Prof. Dustin, it's about uh, in, in some, some modern, modern countries, countries in the awareness of spiritual, of spiritual uh, teachings are not, are not taught, taught in, in formal, formal religions. religions. How about, How about these, these practices, practices in your, your country? country? Well, of course, uh, my own country is uh, extremely diverse. So we have 
representative representative almost all spiritual traditions you could find. Uh, of course, uh, and of course the the percentage of people in different traditions is much different. If you go from uh, America, if you go to certain parts of Africa or other regions, uh, but uh, spirituality is um, can be found in many traditions. Uh, so one can be um, one can meditate even, uh, for example, in pre uh, Muhammad himself, God peace be upon him, he was in a tradition of uh, meditation before the revelation came to him. Uh, so that was a meditative tradition that wasn't um, maybe inspired by God, but it wasn't yet in the form of Islamic um, practice as, as later came to the revelation. So yes, one can be, one can be uh, maybe um, uh, worship idols, but one can also um, enter a kind of a spiritual trance and, and leave this world and, and uh, go to another uh, level. So I think that is a, is a possibility. And so that's something we, we can't um, rule out spirituality of, of the diversity of traditions in this world. Okay, Pai. Are, Are you happy, happy with, with Prof. Dustin's, Dustin's uh, answers? answers? Is okay, thank you, Mr. Datsun, for your information. But if you can see uh, the practical uh, mysticism in Indonesia, maybe the phenomenon is very, very uh, a polar phenomenon. It is because when uh, the people uh, have a practical in a spirituality uh, in, in there, uh, they have many motivation, not just uh, to uh, find the gods, uh, but uh, the motivation uh, some people uh, they use uh, spirituality uh, sometime uh, to get uh, 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 how to be right man. Yeah, uh, you can uh, explain, uh, Miss uh, Titin, that in Japanese tradition. We have pesugian, yeah. <laughs> this is the spirituality also, uh, but it, it, it's called a black spirituality. I don't know. Uh, is there in the Yuri uh, country we find uh, like that? <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm although I'm, certain, I'm somewhat familiar with Japanese culture. Uh, but I'm not certain of, I don't think I am aware of that to refer to what you call the black spirituality. So I cannot comment about that specifically since I don't think I understand it enough to comment on it. But um, it's uh, something, if, if it's something that may, um, of course, there are Indonesians who live in America and then they maybe come from Java and they may bring with them uh, those, uh, that kind of spiritual practice, which is very possible. I'm not aware of it, of course, but that is something very possible. But um, you yourself might explain to us uh, what you mean by this black spirituality, which I am. Uh, if, if it's a, if it's an effort to become to gain um, uh, knowledge of, of oneself and of God, and the, and the uh, then it's uh, in line with the other kind of spirituality. If, if there's to be a distinction, um, so. But if it's negative and it, uh, it is. Uh, used to, um, to breed hate um, against others and negative thoughts, and it is not what kind of spirituality I am um, promoting or we're speaking about. Okay, thank you, Mr. Justin. Maybe next time I want to learn more from you about spirituality in uh, your country. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Pak Imam, and thank, thank you, uh, Prof. Dustin, has answered has the answered questions that uh, the, the reference of uh, uh, Prof. Dustin is about, about spirit, spirituality, uh, good deeds, and uh, everything about uh, good manners that promote tolerance and harmony. Is that right, Prof. Dustin? That's correct, yes. That's, That's my, right. uh, my interpretation of uh, positive spirituality. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. And uh, we, still we still have, have time, time. about uh, 
20, 14, 15 minutes to invite the participants to address questions, maybe in the chat box provided. Or maybe some participants have raised hand. You should I have featured. In Bahasa Indonesia, it's okay because Prof. Dustin speaks Indonesian very well, even in Arabic, because Prof. Dustin can speak many languages. Any question? Okay. Okay. From uh, Yuli, from the Chat box. box. Prof, uh, bagaimana akhlak hitam, hitam diajarkan di negeri Anda? Akhlak, 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 akhlak Islam. Islam. <laughs> akhlak Islam. Islamic, uh, you know that Islamic values are very universal and uh, it can be taught everywhere and, and, and about uh, how about uh, Islamic values taught in your country. Prof. Dustin, ya silakan untuk menjawab. Pasti diajarkan di pusat-pusat studi agama Islam di universitas seperti Harvard dan di Chicago, Wisconsin. Semua di mana ada studi agama Islam pasti akhlak kita Islam diajarkan dan tapi itu tidak secara luas pasti ada contoh tuju juta penduduk beri nama Islam di Amerika dan mereka punya masjid-masjid dan sekolah putih mereka sekolah agama Islam pasti akhlak Islam diajarkan di instansi pendidikan tersebut. Tapi secara luas tidak. Itu secara di pusat studi agama Islam dan di sekolah yang didirikan oleh umat Islam di Amerika Serikat. So in in you might say that yes, there are many centers for Islamic studies. And there are many institutions that maybe offer one or two courses only within a, in the, in the for example, the Car Department of Religious Studies, there might be uh, one or two courses on Islam. And of course, the, you cannot avoid um, talking about Islamic values if you study Islam as a religion. So yes, you'll find uh, courses, but it, and the, you won't find uh, that on a national level uh, in the media normally unless you have a documentary one, you won't find any reference whatever to that if you, if you um, listen to the traditional media, which is anti-tolerant, for example, Fox News is completely anti-tolerant, it's supporting um, the, um, the, the big corporations and the Trumpists, the people, Trump, so they won't find any reference to that, or you'll only find negative images of Islam and Islamic values. Uh, but if you have more neutral news outlets like CNN, uh, you will sometimes find documentaries that will reflect the reality in a better way. Um, but Islamic values are not um, commonly taught, for example, in high schools um, throughout the country, uh, normal high schools. So that means that we have a lot of work to do. And that's why there are more centers being established throughout the country to um, educate people more about Islam, not, not it's portrayed by the Media such as Fox News, Islam is a is a threat to our society. It is a breeder of terrorism. That is a, is a false message which is being propagated, and it's led to the I think uh, 
the election of President Trump in 2016. Um, he built his campaign on fear of the other, fear of the immigrants, fear of the quote unquote Islamic terrorists. And so these are messages that we have to uh, contradict. And that's what the University of Wisconsin is doing is trying to foster diversity, having forums about religion and Islam. And, and so yes, but it's a, it's a, we have we all have to work together to counteract the negative forces which are propelling a negative in the Islam in America and in many Western countries. But of course we have those, we have those centers, we have that, that's why and I am, and these pe people that study Islam uh, from different traditions are then trying to be bridges between cultures and become world, true world citizens. Okay, thank, thank you, you Prof. Destin. Destin. And then, and then uh, uh, for, for the third, third question, we, we can check, check on, on the chat, chat box. box. He's, He's from, from Devi uh, P. P. Prof. Prof. Dustin, thank, thank you for, for your great presentation. And uh, uh, she is now, now doing, doing a research, research on promoting, promoting peace, peace literary, literary tolerance and harmony in the level of family and uh, uh, schools. She uh, asked your email address, address and, uh, and further, further she, she wants, wants to have, have consultation about her, her research, research with you. This is a private, private message. message. Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Dustin. Dustin. Uh, and, and there, there is, is a question, question too, too in the uh, chat, chat box. box. Yeah. yeah. And, and raise hands. Hand too. Uh, yeah. yeah, there, there are, are two, two, two uh, participants, participants asking you questions, questions Prof. Dustin. Dustin. The, first the first one, one is, is on Istihara, and, and the second, second one, one is. is Oh, oh, Mr. Mr. Gopal. Gopal. Okay, okay please, please address, address your, your questions. questions. But is the hara? Sisundari. Itu tadi saya tanya di chat itu, tolong dilihat. Ya. Ya. There are some three. Ya. Prof, I will ask you questions. How is the relationship between Islam and in your, in your country, country. Uh, how, how about, about that, that if you, you are Muslim, Muslim you, you cannot, cannot be, there is there no is pos uh, possibility, possibility for you to become, become a president, president because, because uh, the president, president must be uh, uh, not, not Muslim. Muslim. This is a question from Sayyidul Bahari. Bahari. Yeah. I'll answer that question, yes. Uh, well, it's um, in the United States we have uh, a long tradition of separation of religion and state, in theory at least. Uh, so we still have, we do have on our coinage in God we trust. So there is the idea of a, it's like in, in uh, Indonesia, the idea of a, of a, of a God, which is um, on our coinage. So it's not complete separation of religion and state. Um, so we don't have a, it used to be when I was in grammar school, uh, the Bible is read to us because everyone in the school was of uh, Christ Christian faith. Um, so that was not an issue. But then uh, there were um, some legal actions taken uh, past 30 or 40 years. That now you cannot uh, read from the Bible in the school system because that means you're favoring one religious tradition over another in a public school. Of course, you can do that in a private school. So there are many private schools, there are Islamic schools, Catholic schools different schools, but not in a public school, in theory at least. 
as far as um, can a resident be of any faith? In legally, yes. There's nothing preventing that. And the Supreme Court would have to, would have if a person of a different faith uh, were elected, there is no, nothing uh, that forbids that person to become the president. But we, but we have to think of social reality. If we think about before 1960, every single president was a male, we call a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, like myself. I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, from an English tradition. So the, I'm part of the ruling class, you might say. In 1960, um, there was a, a contest for the presidency, and one of the candidates was John F. Kennedy. He was a Catholic, and there was quite a bit of controversy. What if he's elected? Will he follow the Pope and try to foster upon American society Catholic values? But despite the, the fear, he was elected became, a, and in general, a good president. Of course, he made many mistakes. Um, but um, and then he was assassinated uh, in, in 1963, in tragic assassination. Um, and now the president, I think the second time in history, we have a president who's Catholic, that's Joe Biden. Um, so um, this is, this is something that would not be possible, for example, in the year 1920. You would not imagine uh, electing to the presidency a, a Catholic, which is a minority group in the United States Christian community, uh, so, although quite large. Uh, so, of course, um, we know that uh, President Obama, his father was a Muslim from Kenya. His second name is uh, Barack Hussein Obama. Um, people tried to, um, in the campaign, try to say, oh, he's really a Muslim in disguise. Uh, um, um, they tried to, which was not a problem, of course, but people, of course, you know, propaganda. And in, in, in Indonesia, you have people saying, well, that's, he's not really a true Muslim. He has a Christian mother or something like that. So um, the same thing in America, people, uh, based on their prejudices, um, they try to say, well, he's not really one of us. He's an, an, an other. But there's nothing in the Constitution that disallows a Muslim to become president. So that is simply a legal matter. But whether in practicality one can win enough votes to become president because of social, uh, that's an issue, issue that with the uh, society evolves, hopefully there'll be more open society. And that's the kind of society we're trying to promote where we don't ask people what their religion is when we try to elect them. That's uh, their private matter. Of course, we see in London, we have a, a person, uh, the mayor of London, who is a, a Muslim, a Muslim background. So that is, it happened in a, it's happening in the, in the Western world. It's not something uh, new. Um, or it's new, but it's, it's, it's recent, we might say. And you probably, if you probably look, and we have now in our Congress, we have Muslim uh, women serving as a congresswoman. Um, we have a woman from the Somalia background serving in the House of Representatives from the state of Minnesota. So she's been elected as a Muslim woman wearing hijab. Um, so that shows us that society is evolving and becoming more open-minded, hopefully. Hopefully we don't regress. Of course, that can also happen too, but we hope that our society continues and its approach to be more open-minded, tolerant, so we don't question people's religion when we ask them to be served, become public servants. Hope that answers your question. So, and, and I might also add, uh, many many Muslims may find themselves more free, more free to practice their religion in, in America than in their own countries. For example, in some countries, um, Shiite, Shiites are not um, allowed to practice freely. In some countries, Muslim countries, um, people of the Ahmadiyya. Uh, are not allowed to practice their religion freely. So they come to America and they can have, we have a mosque for the Ahmadiyya, we have mosques for the Shiites, 
and they're free to perhaps they, as they wish. We have no restrictions about that. So there's a sense more freedom in that respect. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. And, and for the last, last question, uh, Abdul Ghaffar has, has been answered to too, that uh, yeah, Islamic, Islamic teachings, teachings in America, America is taught in private schools, schools but not in, in public, public schools. schools. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you very, very much, much uh, Prof. Dustin, because, because the time is up. up. Now, uh, before, before ending, ending this session, session we, would we would like, like to present a keynote, keynote speaker certificate, certificate to you. To you. As, as uh, an expression, expression of, of our, our appreciation, appreciation and your, your kindness, kindness and willingness to share your expertise, expertise in this conference. conference. You receive our certificate. certificate. Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Dustin Cowell, as, as keynote, keynote speaker. speaker. And, and okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, before we go to uh, session two, again, thank you very much, Prof. Dustin, and then uh, we will uh, go to the second presenter. Thank you very much. Okay, okay uh, for, for the, the next, next presenter, presenter or keynote, keynote speaker, speaker, I would like, like to welcome Professor Nadir Sahoshen, or if he's familiar with Kusnavir of Monash University, University, Australia. Australia. Are you Are there, there? Gusnavir? Okay, uh, because, uh, because Prof. Prof. Navir is uh, not with, with us now, now so uh, I, I think, think we have a break, break for five, five to, to ten, ten minutes. minutes. To the screen. Uh, Gusnavir, Gusnavir, are you there? Ya, yeah, ya yeah, sudah gabung. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Uh, before, before starting, starting his presentation, I would, I would like, like to read uh, his CV. Professor Nadir Sahosen of Monash University Australia has been working as an, a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Monash University since 20 of July 2015.
Prior to this role, Nadir has an associate professor at the School of Law, University of Bologo, and he has a bachelor's degree from UIN Sharif Hidayatullah. Uh, Jakarta, a graduate, graduate diploma, diploma in Islamic, Islamic studies, studies and Masters and of Arts with honors from the University of New England, England as well as, as a Master of Laws in Comparative, comparative Law from, from Charles Darwin, Darwin University. University. He, he completed, completed his, his first PhD in Law at the University of Bologna and, and a second PhD on Islamic Law, law at the at National, National University of Singapore. Singapore. Nadir is, is internationally known, known for his expertise in Sharia and, and Indonesia law. law. He is a board, board member of top, top journals such, such as the Asian Journal of Comparative, Comparative Law, Cambridge University, University Press, and the Australian, the Australian Journal of Asian Law, law University, University of Melbourne. Melbourne. His, his articles, articles have, have been published in internationally recognized and, and different journals, journals such, such as the Nordic the Journal of International Law, from Lund University, Asia Pacific Law Review, the City University of Hong Kong, Australian Journal of Asian Law, University of Melbourne, European Journal of Law Reform, Indiana University, Asia Pacific Journals of Human Rights and the Law, Murdoch University, Journal of Islamic Studies, Oxford University, and Journal of Southeast Asian Studies, Cambridge University. He has, he has been, been invited, invited and funded to deliver his, his public, public lecture in many top Indonesian universities. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> he has, he has appeared many, many times in Indonesian national television and uh, in uh, Indonesian, Indonesian communities, communities as Gus Nadir. Gus Nadir's today keynote presentation is Islamic uh, law, freedom, and the sustainable development goals in Indonesia. Okay, okay. Welcome, welcome to the, to the screen, screen. Uh, Gus Nabil. Ya, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wabihi nasta'in ala umurutina waddin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amabad. Ini saya pertama tes suara. Apakah suara saya terdengar jelas ya? Sudah terdengar jelas. Alhamdulillah, jelas Pak. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, ya. uh, saya izin buat uh, share screen ya. Oke, okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much for the organizing committee for inviting me and also uh, thank you for uh, Ibu Titin uh, as a chair of this uh, session. Uh, My topic is about Islamic law, freedom, and the sustainable development goals in uh, Indonesia. So, uh, <clears throat> the 2030 agenda for uh, sustainable development adopted by all United Nations, mem United Nations member states in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet, for now and into the future. Uh, at its heart uh, are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all countries, develop and developing in a global partnership. So these, uh, uh, those countries, they recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. Uh, sustainable development goals has definition, principles and dimensions with a focus on integrating economic, social and environmental. So of course, then the question would be, how these sustainable development goals uh, could be uh, discussed in the context of uh, Islamic law and also in the context of uh, freedom? And uh, there are at least three different approaches 
to discuss uh, this issue. So first, I have reviewed many articles on Islamic law and SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and found that most of them take a normative position. So this is the first approach that we can have, a normative position. What I mean by a normative uh, approach is that uh, they make a claim that the Islamic perspective embraces that everything on earth is created for humanity in God's award to people. Uh, Islam allows the consumption of the natural environment without involving unnecessary distractions. Sharia views that human activities should support environment and protection of people's rights and needs, ensuring that human activities do not compromise the essentials of social, economic, and natural systems either now or in the future. This normative approach went as far as identifying the Quranic verses and the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that match the 17 goals of sustainable development goals. It is what we call it chochokology in Indonesian term or cherry picking in English terms. So uh, this normative uh, approach, they just try to find the 17 goals of SDG and find in each 17 goals a quotation from the text of the Quran and Hadith in order to illustrate how Islamic law position is actually uh, support these sustainable development goals uh, by cherry picking the Quranic verse or the Hadith without giving a comprehensive uh, 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 analysis on why, on why uh, those uh, textual, those religious texts uh, could match with the 17 goals, or in other words, what is the, uh, the interpretations and also the historical context of those uh, Quranic statements and uh, uh, prophet statements, uh, they do not discuss that. They just want to find and then to illustrate that uh, uh, actually uh, nothing wrong with these sustainable development goals. So this is what we call it uh, a normative uh, approach. And the second approach is using a, a Makassibu Sharia approach to explain the link between Islamic law and sustainable development goals. Uh, in, uh, so then the, the question would be, uh, what is the legal status of these 17 goals under the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. So, uh, and, and this, second, this second approach using a Makassir Sharia try to answer that. And uh, if, we, if we look at uh, 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 these 17 goals, so these uh, uh, 17 goals, uh, number one is uh, no poverty, where uh, so uh, number two is zero hunger, uh, three good health and well-being, as you can see uh, in, in uh, on my screen, uh, quality education number four, number five gender equality, and then clean water and sanitation. Um, number number seven affordable and clean energy. Uh, Next, uh, number eight, decent work and economic growth. Uh, number nine, industry, innovation, in infrastructure. Number 10, reduce inequality. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Number 12, responsible consumption and production. And number 13, climate action. Number 14, life below water. Number 15, life on land. And uh, number 16, peace and justice, strong institution. And finally, number 17, partnership to achieve the goal. <clears throat> um, although the uh, SDGs here, the Sustainable Development Goals, have not been developed on a religious basis, but most goals uh, are not less aligned with the spirit of Islamic law, I believe. 
So Muslim are duty bound by their religion to ensure the sustenance of the five necessities of uh, Makassidu Sharia. So, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, using this, the second approach, this Makassidu, Makassidu Sharia approach is very useful to find the link between uh, Islamic law and sustainable development goals. So we do not only look at the textual text or the normative position like the first approach, but here we, we go further by looking at uh, the objectives of uh, uh, Sharia. And then if we read the classic book of Sharia, it is all about Ahkamul Khamsa. There are obligatory, recommended, uh, permitted, disliked, and forbidden. If we apply this uh, classic approach, the question would be, what is the legal status of each 17 items under sustainable development goals that I already uh, saw you in the previous slide? Uh, but when we look at the, uh, the, uh, the second approach here, uh, to explain the link between Islamic law and sustainable development goals, we can see that actually the main goals of the uh, sustainable development goals uh, focus on the five piece here. So if we have Makotul Sharia, as we all know, uh, Makotul Sharia encompass the five necessities of human existence, the preservation of uh, faith, life, intellect, lineage, and wealth, Hifzul Din, Hifzul Nafas, Hifzul Akal, Hifzul Mal. So then this uh, uh, five necessities of human assistance, we can see there is a, a correlation with uh, the five P's is the main goals of the sustainable development goals, like uh, people, uh, the well-being of all people, planet, uh, the protection of the Earth's ecosystems, prosperity, continued economic and technological growth, peace, securing peace, and partnership, improving internal, international uh, cooperation. And uh, as uh, we know that uh, there, are, there has been also a discussion among Muslim scholars about the five uh, elements of uh, Makassar Sharia. Uh, some contemporary scholars uh, propose uh, to add uh, other elements. So they said that why we only limit Makassar Sharia into five uh, necessities? Of the Ruria. Why not we extend the component of Makoto Sharia so then we could also cover the, uh, the contemporary issues like uh, global climate, for instance, the environment, and, uh, and others. So I think uh, uh, it, it will be interesting if we use the second approach of Makoto Sharia here. Uh, unlike the first one, it is only a normative position like a cherry picking. Uh, here we uh, we focus more on the substance of the Islamic law, which is the goals of Sharia, and then uh, Muslim scholars are in a better position to determine uh, how these seventeen goals of sustainable development goals. Uh, could be in line with uh, Makostur Sharia. And then uh, if we uh, look at the, uh, the issue of uh, freedom here, uh, when I check the 17 goals, uh, then I found that uh, number 16, uh, which is peace and justice strong institution, it says that uh, <clears throat> the uh, the goal of number 16 is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies uh, for sustainable uh, development, provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. And then uh, in each of the goals here, uh, usually there'll be a target. And so for the goals number 16, this includes 10 targets. And then the uh, the tense target here, it says that to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. 
Therefore, I will focus my discussion on uh, protection of fundamental freedom and Islamic law to achieve uh, sustainable development goals here. So, so many Muslim scholars are firm in their belief that uh, Sharia uh, addresses the fundamentals of human rights. So for instance, they identify the most important human rights principles in Islam to be dignity and brotherhood, equality among members of the community without distinction on the basis of race, color, or class, respect for the honor, reputation, and family of each individual, the right of each individual to be presumed innocent until and unless proven guilty and individual freedom. This position suggests that Islamic law does protect human rights, but according to uh, its own set of values. And these values are fixed in divine law, Sharia, and are considered to be superior to any law created by humans and established by international institutions. Those Muslim scholars use the concept of cultural relativism to legitimate their uh, adherence to Sharia vis-a-vis -vis human rights. Uh, but of course, some tensions occur concerning, for instance, the allegedly unequal treatment of women in the Muslim world and religious liberty, including the rights to change one's belief and to interreligious marriage. Uh, so this high plus the tension between human rights in Islam as they exist in relation to obligation toward God, fellow humans, and nature, and the human rights adopted by international human rights institutions. Uh, and then if we look at what happened in Indonesia, <clears throat> uh, Article 28E1 of the 1945 Constitution recognizes the right to choose a religion, but does not include the right to change one's religion. Uh, and it is worth noting that there is no punishment in Indonesian criminal law for those who change their religion. For, for example, from Islam to Christianity, since Hudud, the Islamic criminal, criminal code, is not applicable in Indonesia. Although apostasy is not considered a crime, mentioning the right uh, to apostasy is a different thing and would have invited anger from Muslim leaders. So this brings me to the third approach. Uh, here I already mentioned at the outset that there are three approaches here, normative and makoto sharia. And, and then when we talk about the uh, uh, the freedom in the context of uh, sustainable development goals, then uh, this will lead to the third approach, the adoptions of cultural, rational, and ethical aspects of uh, Islamic law. As we know that Islamic law is the world's third major legal system after the common and civil law systems. And although the Quran and uh, Sunnah are the original sources of Islamic law, the Islamic legal system has evolved many other sources, methodologies, and perspectives. Like any other legal system, the Islamic legal system has developed over many centuries in various Muslim societies, incorporating local cultures and customs, as well as some limited state decrees, and particularly the work of Muslim jurists. There are no theological reasons why Islam should be in contradiction to human rights, democracy, the rule of law, civil society, and pluralism. And also there are no theological reasons why Islam should be in contradiction uh, to uh, the economic achievement or proper prosperity, and also to the issue of uh, environmentalism. So my presentation today is an attempt or an effort within an Islamic legal context to demonstrate that Islam as a religious, cultural, political, ethical, and economic worldview could deal with the rapidly modernizing and ever-changing world that we live in today. This does not mean that it neglects revelation and reason in the classical sense, but rather it uses classic Islamic legal discourse as a vehicle to respond to some modern issues. I personally do not neglect classical Islam's richly textual basis as such a collection of knowledge provide valuable tools to respond to questions and problems in the contemporary Islamic world. At the same time, 
I do not treat these classical works as the only source of authority, but as important for the legal reasoning or ijtihad of each scholar devoted to reaching solutions to challenges in their respective contexts. The ethical approach under Islamic law is also important. It means that rationality alone is not enough, as ethics is one of the core elements of Islamic teachings. Islamic teachings are not confined to acts of worship and prayer and to a set of moral counsels, as Islam has dealt dealt with a people's relation with God, it has also given the broad lines of human beings' relations with each other. It has, in various forms, dealt with individual rights and obligations too. So the rational and ethical and also cultural approaches of Islamic law would enrich our discussion on sustainable development goals. Above all, each of these approaches that I just described in my presentation today, they are all part of ijtihad. And the prophet said that when a jurist or a judge exercises ijtihad and reaches a correct conclusion, they will receive a double reward. But if the conclusion is incorrect, they will receive a single reward. So uh, I'm not sure uh, how many rewards that we will get today by discussing this issue, but hopefully uh, at least we can get one reward and hopefully um, if God uh, is generous enough uh, for us today, then we we'll, we'll can get a double reward. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you, Bu Titin. Uh, <clears throat> Terima kasih semuanya. Subhanakallah ilmalana illa ma'alam tanah inna kantala ilmu hakim, mahasu cinta ya Rob. Sungguh kami tidak punya ilmu apapun, kecuali apa-apa yang telah engkau jarakan kepada kami. Wahdul Muafiq ila komentarik. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Gus Nadir, for your uh, impressive presentations. And uh, the topic is really uh, wonderful. Uh, just know you presented about how Islamic law support the 17 goals formulated on sustainable development goals. And uh, we invite... Uh, Questions, questions from the participants. participants. You can, you can uh, write, uh, write your, your questions, questions on the chat, chat box provided, provided or uh, by, by raising, raising hands. hands. Feature. Feature. Okay. okay. You can directly, directly address, address your, your questions, questions to Gusnavir. Okay, we are, we are waiting, waiting for. for okay. Oh, you, oh, can, you can uh, write, uh, write down, down your, your questions, questions in Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesia. Two. Two. Don't, Don't worry, worry about that. Iya, boleh. Kalau mau tanya Bahasa Indonesia juga boleh, silakan. Oke. Okay. 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 From participants. Mungkin ini ya, uh, uh, Bu Titin, mungkin yeah. uh, uh, masih terasa asing uh, kita bahas soal Sustainable Development Goals, itu kalau di Indonesia itu, istilah bahasa Indonesia itu adalah tujuan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Hmm. ya Jadi jadi ini memang uh, kita bicara apa yang terjadi uh, sampai tahun 2030 nanti. Jadi semua, semua uh, pembangunan yang akan kita lakukan memang Kalau dalam konteks uh, PBB ini memang diarahkan untuk uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Gitu ya. Jadi bahkan di, di kampus saya, di Monash University itu, sekarang semua publikasi itu juga dibikin poinnya. Gitu. Jadi jadi dinilai poin uh, publikasi saya itu uh, masuk ke Sustainable Development Goals yang nomor berapa. Gitu ya. uh, karena memang semuanya sekarang lagi diarahkan kepada ini. Gitu. Jadi tentu uh, ketika kita bicara soal uh, Islamic Law, uh, ini menjadi uh, uh, sumbangan penting bagaimana kemudian Islamic law bisa ikut ber, berkontribusi ya terhadap uh, uh, diskursus atau wacana uh, sustainable development goals ini atau tujuan pembangunan berkelanjutan kita. Sudah ada yang tanya belum? Atau uh... Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Masuk, Prof. 
eh, Bunda Titin, mohon izin. Ya. ya. Silah, silah. Profesor, perkenalkan saya, saya Bu Husna, eh, anggota daripada mahasiswa IAI, IAIN, Pasca Sarjana Pekalongan, semester awal. Terima kasih atas pemaparannya. Sekalipun, mohon maaf, saya dengan kemampuan yang ada, tidak bisa menyimak secara tuntas. Tetapi inti sari daripada paparan tersebut, ada pada tajuk atau tema yang Profesor sampaikan. <tuh> eh, melihat daripada tujuan pembangunan dengan ya, di Indonesia yang disampaikan oleh Prof berdasarkan tajuk yang tadi disampaikan, mohon penjelasannya Profesor eh, bahwasanya apakah di Indonesia ini sudah betul-betul pembangunan yang sustainable? Karena kita dapati dari setiap pemilu pergantian presiden ke presiden yang terbarukan lagi, yang barunya lagi, ini programnya tidak sama. Dari pergantian menteri lama ke menteri baru, programnya tak serupa. Dari pergantian gubernur, bupati, bahkan kepala daerah pun tidak sama. Eh, bagaimana Profesor menyampaikan Sustainable atau sustainable apa yang Profesor sampaikan di Indonesia ini sehingga ada fakta dan bukti yang nyata di apa namanya ketika dibanding dengan program-program yang tidak bersambungan di Indonesia. Begitu Prof, begitu Bunda ya. Titin. Terima kasih. Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Ya. Boleh saya jawab langsung? Boleh. Uh, ya. Boleh. Oke. Okay. Ya. 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 Ya, jadi kalau kita lihat uh, dari uh, 17 uh, goal-nya ya, tujuan uh, yang di uh, yang disepakati oleh uh, PBB uh, itu memang sangat menarik bagaimana uh, Indonesia uh, sudah melaksanakannya atau belum. Ya, misalnya saja ketika tujuan pertama yaitu no poverty, tidak ada kemiskinan. Saya kira selama Covid ini malah kemiskinan kita bertambah gitu ya. Dan ini menjadi, menjadi tantangan uh, tersendiri. Kemudian. Uh, tujuan kedua, tanpa kelaparan, zero hunger. Nah, ini kan juga menjadi uh, pertanyaan besar. Nah, tetapi dalam konteks diskusi kita, uh, dan konteks islami kita tadi, misalnya itu kalau uh, para sahabat cermati, misalnya di goal nomor lima, itu ada gender equality. Ya, ada kesetaraan gender. Jadi teman-teman yang uh, suka bahas soal bagaimana perspektif gender di dalam Islam, ya, itu sebetulnya turut menyumbang atau berkontribusi terhadap diskusi goal nomor lima, yaitu gender equality. Kemudian misalnya juga goal nomor enam, ya, clean water and sanitation, air bersih dan sanitasi layak. Ini kalau kita ke pesantren-pesantren, ya ini, ini tentu menjadi pertanyaan besar. Bagaimana dalam konteks umat Islam, air bersih itu sudah tersedia. Kita tahu bagaimana misalnya dalam fikih itu uh, ukurannya adalah dua kulah. Jadi kalau air itu dua kulah itu dianggap suci menyucikan misalnya. Sehingga uh, asal sudah ada air itu dalam kolam, ya gitulah. Akhirnya di pondok pesantren kita tahu banyak yang nyebur di dalam kolam, uh, cuci kaki nyemplung ke kolam, setelah itu ada yang kumur-kumur juga di kolam, dan seterusnya. Dengan, dengan mengatakan ini sudah suci menyucikan karena sudah dua kulah, terpenuhi secara fikih. Tetapi apakah ini, ini ini terpenuhi secara medis? Apakah higienis? Ya, apakah tidak ada bakterinya misalnya? Nah, ini menjadi jadi pertanyaan besar. Bagaimana kita uh, memahami hukum Islam uh, dalam konteks uh, sustainable development goals ini? Bahwa ternyata ukuran-ukuran uh, uh, air bersih dua kulah yang terpenuhi secara fikih itu juga mungkin uh, harus kita tambah ukurannya dengan uh, ini tadi, dengan clean water and uh, sanitation misalnya. Begitu juga misalnya uh, uh, tema mengenai uh, sustainable cities and communities, kota dan komunitas yang berkelanjutan. Ini juga ini, ini internet saya nggak sta, stabil katanya. Apa masih kedengeran ya? Hmm. Masih ya? Masih, okay. Okay. Masih. ya. Jadi ini juga disebut uh, tentang kota dan, dan komunitas berkelanjutan. Ini kan juga penting bagaimana kemudian uh, hukum Islam mendefinisikan Tata kota kita seperti apa? 
bahwa banyak sekali yang daerah-daerah nggak cuma di Jakarta tapi juga di daerah lain yang banjir misalnya saat musim hujan sekarang itu kan menunjukkan tidak sustainable. Nah itu sebetulnya dalam kajian hukum Islam seperti apa ini persoalan tata kota ini? Karena kita kan lebih banyak bicaranya soal halal haram ya soal ritual gitu. Nah, tapi diskusinya kalau kita geser dengan konteks 17 Sustainable Development Goals ini akan menjadi sangat kaya dan sangat menarik. Bagaimana pandangan Islam menciptakan kota, ya Islam sekarang kota yang syari gitu ya, bukannya sekedar ada masjidnya gitu. Ya. Kan sekarang banyak tuh real estate syari, ya yang dipikir adalah yang banyak masjid yang ada di masjid yang di dalam, ada suara azannya, terus kemudian penduduknya orang Islam semua, apa yang seperti itu? Uh, yang kita harapkan sebagai sustainable development, sustainable cities and communities gitu ya, atau kita bicara soal pengairan, ya, kita bicara soal uh, uh, tingkat kebisingan, level of noisy, ya, kita bicara tentang uh, lingkungan yang hijau, itu lingkungan yang tidak banjir, nah ini kan juga Islamik loh sebetulnya, hukum Islam juga sebetulnya, gitu. nah ini makanya uh, sengaja saya uh, bawa ke, ke tema ini, atau misalnya tujuan yang ke sebelas ya, responsible consumption and production. konsumsi dan produksi yang bertanggung jawab, misalnya. Nah ini juga kita ribut dengan masalah halal, ya sertifikat halal. Quran sendiri punya halalan toyibah, 